Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. Today is Friday, April 28th. It is day two of share This is your opportunity to support the proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere, here on KFUO. Today's share episode of Sharper Iron gives us another opportunity to spend the four segments of the program looking out of the, bo- of the book of the Bible with four chapters. So today we are in the New Testament, and we are studying the colossal book of Colossians. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Sean Kilgo. Pastor Kilgo serves at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence, Kansas. Pastor Kilgo, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, it's great to be here. So we get to study an entire book of the Bible today. Pastor Kilgo, they did not give us any extra time when we asked for it prior to the show, so we have an hour to study Colossians. Yeah, when no I told problem. my congregation that, they all laughed. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's give it a go then. So give us a brief introduction to the epistle that Paul writes to the Colossians. I already took care of the author for you. There you go. Yeah, so uh, it's written around the year 60 AD, so this is going to be one of the the later epistles. Uh, Paul is in jail in Rome. Uh, this is what's going on at the end of his life. Um, you you have one of the main characters in, uh, in Colossians is Epaphras, and it's not entirely clear who this guy is. He does show up also in uh, Philemon, uh, because the, the context of Philemon is in Colossae. And so... Uh, it seems like this guy is perhaps a pastor in uh, Colossae, has some contact, uh, some connection to Paul, uh, is possibly like even like maybe a, a student of Paul and has gone and um, been you know, found the church in Colossae. As far as we can tell, uh, St. Paul never actually goes to Colossae, so it's kind of an interesting letter in that he doesn't have necessarily a direct connection uh, to uh to this church in this area like he does the other uh, many of the other uh, letters that he writes um, and one of the the reasons that this is being written is in response to Paphras who it seems is asking Paul for help in addressing some false teaching that has arisen within the church there and this is maybe just a good little side reminder that just about all the books like all the epistles the the prophets all this stuff is written to address false teaching Mm. um the lord cares very deeply about making sure that we have his unadulterated word and true doctrine and so this is what's kind of constantly going on with all the epistles and whatnot colossians is no different you you meant it's a uh, colossal book it's not in its size it is one of the smaller ones but theologically it's immensely dense so it's it's quite a wonderful text yeah, well, and the, the adjective colossal, this I learned at, at Lutheran High School in San Antonio when I took New Testament class. That was the way that they, they helped us to remember some of the things that are brought up in Colossians, that Christ is presented as the, the colossal one. And, and we're going to take a look at that here in chapter one. You mentioned false teaching. Just briefly, what might be some of the false teachings in the background Paul's talking about in, in Colossians? Um, so one is going to be kind of this uh, this Gnosticism or maybe even proto-Gnosticism, which is basically that uh, you have a, a secret revealed knowledge from God that is apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. Um, it's what we will talk about in the confessions is being enthusiasm. Uh, so if you run across that that word from your pastor in the confessions, that's kind of the same deal that's going on there. Um, another one is it seems like there's a false understanding of things like circumcision and festivals sabbaths all this sort of stuff you get that especially in chapter two and then you also have a uh, a sort of asceticism that's going on in there and asceticism is um a, a form of abstaining from things uh, for the purpose of making yourself more holy and this is where you get paul talking about he says uh, do not handle do not taste it's etc it's this sort of deal and it's it's very akin to kind of um uh, like a monastic life where you take these vows of 
of celibacy and poverty and this sort of stuff. Okay. So those are some of the false teachings in view that in this epistle that Paul writes to the Colossians. Paul writes it, he mentions Timothy and his greeting. There is a, a pretty standard thanksgiving given to the Colossians for the Colossians. It is probably worth pointing out just briefly that Paul has that trio, faith, love, and hope in that order in the first couple verses of this book. He prays for the Colossians, mm -hmm. verses 13 and 14, about being delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's a pretty important verse, but especially verses 15 to 20 of chapter one, I really think lay out the the foundation for the entire epistle. So as we look at chapter one in this first segment, I think that's where we should focus our attention. So help us into especially those verses, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. Yeah, so this is, a lot of the epistles have what we might call like a thesis statement um, that kind of understand the rest of it. And um, I mean, not laid out in, in the academic sense, but in the sense of like, if you're writing a letter at some point at the beginning, you're gonna tell the person you're writing to in theory, what you're going to be talking about and this is kind of the, the chief thing that saint paul is going to be talking about and it is the the nature of christ particularly that he is god in the flesh uh and kind of the rest of the epistle is going to kind of be unpacking what that means for us and and how we get connected to that reality but this very first section is just kind of driving in this point that uh, jesus is not a new creation of god He's not a different God. He's not any of these these ideas that pop up in the uh, in the false teachings of the early church and and since that he is actually God. He's in the flesh. Um, he's the one that creates everything. Everything's created for him. This is this whole section in there. And there's this interesting thing in this where you get a bunch of alls that show up. And uh, my my experience has been when when Saint Paul especially starts throwing a bunch of alls at you, you you ought to pay attention because he's he's kind of unpacking something. Uh, one of the great mysteries of the faith tends to be sitting around in that section. So take us into some of the alls that Paul mentions here. What is what is Christ responsible for that he keeps using all? Yeah, so you get um, he's the firstborn of all creation. We'll we'll kind of come to to that in a minute. Um, all things are created um, uh, by him, uh, through him and for him. Uh, he's before all things, all things in him hold together. So you get all this kind of created language in there. Um, uh, and then he's the being the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, in all things, um, he might be preeminent. That is the, the foremost, the head. Um, for in him, and this is kind of the, the big kind of, in your face statement in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things right so so all the things that have been created you get all these alls and this created language that's going on and then um it comes to a head in that um all the fullness of god is dwelling in in christ and because of the work of christ all of creation that has fallen and that includes us is being reconciled to himself um and and that to himself is maybe a, a very important it we don't want to read past that it seems like maybe just kind of throwaway language at first but these things are not being reconciled to the father um it, at least explicitly it's being reconciled to the entirety of the the godhead but because Paul is addressing this issue of who is Christ and that he actually is God, the fact that he says that he's reconciling all things to himself is important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and okay, so this is where, again, that word colossal that I've used, Andy's used it here in introducing this, that's where you see this in this text, that when you have Christ, you have everything that you need. And I think that's going to, to set up what Paul will do in chapter two, especially when he starts to address those false teachings the other places where, where people are looking in these regulations, the asceticism that you mentioned, you don't need those things. You have Christ. And if you have Christ, you have all. You have the one in whom the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. You have all things. And he is the one who has reconciled all things to himself. And I know we, we're in verses 15 to 20, but then it does strike me that when you have this very cosmic picture of, of what Christ has done, the verses that follow in verses 21 and 22 are a reminder. Oh, and, and this is for you. It is for all, but it is for you. And that's the, there's the gospel. 
Right. This is this wonderful thing that the scriptures uh, do just kind of all over the place where they'll, they'll present like the really big thing. And, you know, the Christ, you know, for example, Christ is dying for the sins of the world. And then it makes this shift um, to the, to the sing to the first person singular um, to I or to you. Right. Um, and it becomes this, this, subjective reality so so the scriptures will take these objective realities that god has created all things and he's created you that he's redeemed all things and he's redeemed you that he's sanctifying all things and he sanctifies you so he he gives us the big picture and then he drives it into our own consciences to say and, and this is actually for you yeah, so Christ, the one in whom the fullness of the deity dwells bodily, he has come for you to reconcile you to himself, just as he has reconciled all things. So there is Colossians chapter 1, in summary, setting the stage for the rest of the epistle, some of the things that Paul is going to address. We're going to take a short break here on Sharper Iron. Here's some opportunities how we can support the work of KFUO. We will be right back to this study in a little bit. Please stick around. You're listening to share 2023, Sharper Iron with Pastor Apple and Pastor Kilgo. It is a great study of the book of the Colossians, breaking it up into today. several segments today. Well, four, four chapters in the four segments. It's a great study. You can give us a call today and partner with KFUO, 1-800-730-2727, 1-800-730-2727, or 314-821-0850 to be a part of share today. There's a matching gift fund. We're still at about $54,000. So if you give a gift today, that is doubled um, from that matching gift fund of about $54,000. So... Uh, give us a call today and be a part of share 2023. Now, if you give a gift at, let's say, oh, I think we should talk about socks today. What do you think, Pastor Apple? Should we talk about socks? I think we should. All right. I so if you probably wearing some socks, I, I have my KFUO socks I'm on today. Great socks. You know, I should turn on the, the uh, studio camera so everyone can see KFUO we socks. See these socks. That's right. Uh, so if you see, there's a picture there. I can't get my socks up that high to show them on the camera, although apparently Jordan did yesterday. Uh, if you call today and give us a gift of $720, if you make a gift to KFUO of $720 a year or just $60 a month, we would love to send you a pair of KFUO socks to uh, that you could wear around everywhere i mean these are great socks you can wear them to work they're they're appropriate for business or business casual but you can wear them to the gym too if you want everyone to see how much you love kfuo radio uh they've got the kfuo colors the the green and blue on them and they're super comfortable and in addition to supporting kfuo we'd also like to say thank you not with just socks but also a kfuo t-shirt day sponsorship we'll talk more about that later on in the hour about being a kfuo day sponsor and the kfuo stylus pin we'd love to send that to you as well to uh, to say thank you for being a part of KFUO Shareathon in studio with me this morning, Jordan Harms. Good morning, Jordan. Good morning, J two. Jordan, Jordan is running some of the technology behind the scenes so that everybody can see what's going on in, in the studios, uh, the studios at Pastor Apple's church and the studios at Pastor Kilgo's church. This is kind of fun. We've got studios all over Missouri, Illinois, Kansas. We're everywhere. Makes me feel like we're actually kind of official or something. <laughs> well, I want to get back to the study of God's Word today in Sharper Iron as we're looking at Colossians 314-821-0850 or 1-800-730-2727 to partner with KFUO during share 2023. You hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable, a college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran, a college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. 
Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is April 28th. We're studying the book of Colossians with Pastor Sean Kilgo this morning. In the first segment, we talked about chapter 1. Paul lays out his thesis, especially in verses 15 through 20 of that chapter. Christ is all. He has created all things, the one in whom the fullness of the, bo- of the deity dwells bodily. That's the way he's going to phrase it here in chapter 2. So he, he writes in the beginning of chapter 2, he talks about how great a struggle he's had preaching, teaching the truth to these Colossians. And really beginning, I think about in verse six, he starts to get into some of the the places where we see the specific false teaching that he's speaking about. So take us into the verses six and following, start to give us an idea of, of what Paul is talking about against false teaching here. Yeah. So uh, he's reminding them that as you have received Christ, that is, as you received the teaching about Christ, um, walk in him there and th- this is another one of these so it previously we got all these alls there there's a bunch of these like in him and with him uh phrases in here uh that that i think are particularly important uh so you you walk in him you're rooted and built up in him you're established in the faith um in him the whole fullness of the bo- deity dwells bodily you're filled in him in him you're circumcised you're buried with him you're raised with him um, you're made alive together with him, um, and then uh, the the enemies of Christ and of us are put to open shame as he triumphs over them in him. So you get just this this repeated phrasing of all this. Yeah. And one yeah. of the things that go ahead. No, I was just say those those prepositions are really important, and and to see that you're in Christ is is huge. Right, and th- and this is going to be something that's going to come up uh, in the in the third chapter um, as we talk about how we our lives are hid in Christ right this is kind of i think setting the stage for all of that uh but as far as the the, the false teachings and one uh, he says okay you you've received Christ you received the teaching about Jesus don't don't turn away from that be rooted and built up that this in my in my ear sounds uh very reminiscent of both the parable of the sower that sort of language and also uh psalm 1 that he is like a tree planted by streams of water uh, so that we want to be rooted and grounded in God's word so that this is where we're getting our doctrine, our teaching. This is where we're understanding who Christ is and who he is for us, how we are to live that faith, um, as we're going to see in, in a bit. Um, and so he says, see to it then, um, just as you have been uh, rooted and built up and established in this and in this faith, Um, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, empty deceit, human traditions, the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So it kind of comes back to that reality. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is that you're going to hear, and you are hearing all these, all these ideas about Jesus and all these ideas about the world and how you need to be living. And those are a different theology. Those are a different religion than what you already have heard uh, and you need to stay away from those. And he uses this important word, uh, see to it that no one takes you captive. Um, that is that no one um, uh, takes you into a different house. And I think we want to hear the the imagery of the, the strong man in this, where uh, Jesus, who is the stronger man, takes us from the strong man's house and places us into his own house. We are, we are taken out of captivity to the devil and placed into the, the care of our Lord. And the, the warning then is to not fall back into this sort of captivity, and, that, and that's what it is. Mm. So the only way to be free from that captivity, captivity is to remain in Christ. And here again, Paul speaks at, at length of what Christ has done, and he especially gets to the for you. But here he uses that phrase, in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You have been filled in him. And he makes a comparison in verses 11 and 12, especially with circumcision and baptism. What's the comparison Paul makes there? Okay, so um, I think that this is actually one of the more important texts on baptism in the New Testament, um, and it unfortunately doesn't get used a whole lot. But what's really wonderful about this this whole thing is he makes this comparison first off with baptism, that, that baptism is the circumcision made without hands. That is, in the same way you are incorporated into the family of God in the Old Testament, through circumcision, you are incorporated into the family of God. Now, in the New Testament, through baptism, there's a very helpful parallel to the baptism of infants in this, in that 
as soon as you start talking about circumcision, you are placing yourself into um, the reality that Israelite babies are circumcised generally on the eighth day. Um, you're you're incorporating, like I said, that you're brought into the family in this way. But he just he packs all of this stuff into the reality of baptism that's very helpful. So one of the arguments against baptism very often is that you're saved by grace through faith apart from works and that um, therefore you don't need baptism because baptism is a work and it's not faith alone. But look at look at what he does. He says that you are buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith. Uh, it, it's, it's right there. So so that baptism, and this is what we confess in the small catechism, that baptism, apart from faith, doesn't do anything. It's just being, it's just getting wet. And apart from God's word, it's nothing. And that faith grabs onto the promises that God gives you in that word. And here is one of the great promises that you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. How did he do that? How did he make you alive? Having forgiven us all our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us, nailing it to the cross and thereby disarming the rulers. Um, and Pastor Wolfmuller uh, has this great analogy with this that I think is quite wonderful. The, the picture we want to have is that you've got your, uh, all of your debts are written in a book. Um, and Jesus is holding that book when he is nailed to the cross so that his blood just soaks through every page so that you can't read the debt anymore. It's canceled, right? It doesn't, uh, it, it's not condemnatory. It, it doesn't hold any value. It's, it's not going to hold up in a court of law, none of this sort of stuff. And so the blood of Christ is covering uh, your sins and thereby canceling your debt. But again, all of this gets tied back into baptism. And so it's why we'll sing, for example, in the, the great baptismal hymn, um, all that the mortal eye beholds in the font is waters we pour it. But before the eye of faith unfolds the power of Jesus' merit, for here it sees the crimson flood. So that we see in the waters of baptism, uh, Jesus's blood actually pouring over us and covering all our sins, which is precisely what St. Paul's talking about here. Yeah, and, and when you have that, you have everything that you need. And the, I think the, the move, you know, from circumcision to baptism is that in circumcision, you, you didn't have, well, as Paul will use this language in just a moment here in chapter two, circumcision was the shadow, baptism is the reality, because Christ has come and fulfilled that. And so the, the move that he's going to make from this is if you have all of this in Christ, if you have the fulfillment, if in Christ the fullness of deity dwells bodily, if he really is the one who created all things and has reconciled all things to himself, then why do you still cling to these old things, to the shadow? You have the reality, the fulfillment in Christ. And that's where the, the baptism or the circumcision baptism connection is so important. And then he really just takes that and applies it to the whole life of the Christian. Don't submit to these regulations anymore. You have everything you need in Christ. Right. And and also, not only do you have everything you, you need in Christ, you actually have Christ and you're in him. So it makes this shift, uh, similar to what we talked previously, where uh, God has reconciled the world and he, that's you. Um, and God has redeemed the world and that's you. And in him, in, in Christ are all things. And so are you, right? And in, in this then... Because Jesus is the one, this is the very end of this this little section, Jesus is the one who is triumphing over all this stuff, our, our sin, our trespasses, the rulers and authorities. Um, because we are in Christ, we therefore are also victorious over those same things. So this is like what St. What Paul will talk about in Romans, for example, that... Um, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than victors through him who loved us and gave himself up for us. Yeah, well, and Saint, we've been reading First John here on, on Sharp Ryan. We're gonna, going to get into Revelation, and, and St. John uses this language too. In the book of Revelation, for example, in those letters to the seven churches, over and over again, it's, it's to the one who conquers. Well, who is that one who conquers? Mm -hmm. It's the one who has faith in Christ, and, and Paul makes that, or John makes that plain also in his first epistle. The, the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. Christ has overcome the world, and so when we are in him, we share in that victory. This, this is the feast of victory for our God, as we sing on, on Sunday mornings. We have that victory because of Christ, and we share it through faith in him. 
So maybe just just briefly here, Pastor Kilgo, how does this apply then, as Paul, just a summary of the rest of chapter two, don't let anyone pass judgment on you. Why are you submitting to the regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, according to these human, I mean, what what does that mean? Give us just a, a brief pastoral application of the rest of the chapter. Well, so because you belong to Christ and because you're in him, uh, you are free uh, from these, one, you're free from some of the other regulations that have sat there for, for God's people that were designed to set them apart until the coming of the Messiah. Um, but you're also free just kind of in general to um, to enjoy the things that God has given to you. So, I mean, if you want to go and uh, lead a, a quiet life and have minimal possessions and kind of this minimal minimalist life that, that's uh, becoming more popular right now, that's fine. You can do that. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. Um, but there's two things. You One, you can't uh, demand that other people do that as part of their own holiness. And two, you're not earning extra holiness in that. Your holiness is bound to the work of Christ. Um, so you can, you're free to do those things. You're free to not do those things. Um, there are certainly limits on both sides. Um, but there's a lot more freedom that's given to us in Christ on how we're going to live Again, as St. Paul will say elsewhere, not using that freedom as a cover-up for evil, uh, but but using that that freedom uh, uh, in order to enjoy the gifts that God has given us in creation, in order to serve our neighbor, in order to love those that God has placed around us, all these sorts of things, to use that freedom in a good and godly way. Um, uh, and I think probably that the the way to think about this is, this comes up in 1 Corinthians, um, that all things are lawful for me, but, and there's three things that will come after that. Um, not all things are good. Uh, not all things build up and I will not be enslaved or taken captive to anything. And that that's what, what's just come up here. Yeah. Well, and, and Paul in the rest of this epistle is going to draw out, especially into chapter three and four, he's going to draw out the implications of what this means. It's not that we use this freedom as evil or as a cover up for something that we want to do. Rather, we use it in God pleasing ways. He's going to show us what that looks like for those whose lives are hidden in Christ as we pick up chapter three in the next segment. You're listening to Sharper Iron as a part of our special share episode. We're going to take a short break to hear more about ways that you can support the work of KFUO. We'll be right back on Sharper Iron in just a moment. Please consider becoming a day sponsor during our share -thon. Call 314-821-0850 or toll-free 1-800-730-2727. share 2023. I'm Andy Bates in studio with Jordan Harms, and Jordan's going to take a look at the mailbag for us. We have a letter to share with you. Yeah, so from Marlene Reynolds in Indiana, she says, uh, talking about listening on the KVO app on Alexa. She says, I am an 86, I am 86 years old, an 86 year old widow who lives alone. My husband died in 2021 on Reformation Day and was buried the next Sunday when All Saints Day was celebrated. We both enjoyed listening to the Bible study. Last winter, I discovered that I could listen to KFUO on my phone and through my Alexa even though I live in Indiana, and it has been my almost constant companion ever since. I am so thankful for it. Thank you, and may God continue to bless and guide you in your work of spreading the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Marley. And yes, uh, I was just going to say thank you also, Marlene, for, for listening, and may God continue to bless you as well, and thank God for your husband. Thank you, Marlene. Yes, thanks for taking the time to write. And yes, you can listen on Alexa devices. You can listen on the KFUO radio app. There are lots of ways to listen, kfuo.org on your computer. Uh, you can even listen in your car, uh, connecting your phone to your entertainment system in the mm -hmm. car through Bluetooth. Some have uh, Android Audio or, uh, um, or Android Auto. I'm sorry. I'm an iPhone guy, so I have CarPlay. It, well, also, we had, a, we had a listener uh, yesterday talking to us about how she listens through her hearing aids. Oh, yeah. So KFUO and the gospel is literally in your ears all the time. Yeah. KFUO radio, the radio part is just one corner. 
right, right. of you, uh, ways to listen. Many, <clears throat> many new hearing aids have a Bluetooth connectivity right. that you can connect to your phone and then just use the KFUO app on your phone to connect. They just walk around all day listening to KFUO. Yep. No one even has to know you're really listening and you're exactly. hearing it all day long that you've been listening to God's word. You can be uh, studying <laughs> in, inwardly at all times. To be able to provide this resource, this uh, this daily support in God's Word to our listeners, it, it, it does take resources to make that happen. You can partner with us so we can continue doing that. And by making a gift today, your gift will be doubled. Uh, if you call today during the uh, matching gift, uh, you can call 1-800-730-2727 or 314-821-0850. That's 314-821-0850. Jenny's ready to take your call. Pastor Doug is here. Mary and Dan, they're all ready to take your call this morning. Or give us a call at 1-800-730-2727. Back to Sharper Iron in just a moment on KFUO for 2023 share at Lutheran Church Extension Fund, we love church workers. To celebrate their mission and calling to serve God's people, LCEF is offering an exclusive opportunity to both rostered and lay church workers. Hello, my name is Rahema Kavuga, Director of Synod Relations at LCEF. To help you focus on your mission, we want to make it worthwhile to put away a little money each month. If you work for an LCMS, church, school, or organization in any capacity, this opportunity is for you. Visit lcef.org slash cwsa to learn more. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. This Friday, April 28th, we're studying the book of Colossians with Pastor Sean Kilgo this morning. Pastor Kilgo, prior to the break, we made it through the first two chapters of Colossians, and we are now on chapter three. Here, Paul's going to draw out some implications of what it means that you are in Christ, some concrete ways that Christians live in this reality. There's a lot here in chapter three, so let's just jump right in. The first four verses, I think, are sometimes read during the season of Easter. Paul talks about being raised with Christ and seeking the things that are above, your life being hidden with him. What's he saying in those first four verses? Yeah, so I think in this whole section, we want to hear the echoing of the what we might say are the, the consequences of you being baptized. And there's a lot of uh, language that is what we would call baptismal language floating around in here, even right from the outset. Uh, if then you have been raised with Christ, for example, um, that's baptismal language. Remember that uh, St. Paul will say, for example, in, in Romans, uh, that um, that in baptism we are uh, buried with him in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might live in uh, walk in newness of life. Uh, he's just talked about this in a little bit different way. Um, God made alive together with him. Right, that that's resurrection sort of language, especially in the the vein of uh, being dead in your trespasses. So if then you have been raised with Christ, um, and we want to hear like parenthetically after that, which you have because you're baptized, um, then you seek the things that are above. And there, there's almost an echoing all the way back to chapter one in this, um, where you've got the distinction between um, the heaven and the earth. That he has reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And now we're making this distinction again um, that even though God has created all things, there are certain things that we should um, uh, set our minds on, certain things that we should uh, pursue more than others. So the, the created order and the earthly things are good. And, and this will come out, um, we're not, I don't think going to get to this uh, too much today, but like in the table of duties that will come up at the end of chapter three, you can see the... Uh, the upholding of the created order and of created things in there. But also there are there are higher things for us to set our minds on, and particularly um, because those are going to instruct us on how to use the earthly things, right? So set your things on the, set, uh, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God because he's ascended, um, and set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are earth, because... You have died, that's your baptism, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Uh, when Christ, your life, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And he'll list all this, but that, again, put to death, that is baptismal language. So in all of this, he's saying you are baptized, and sitting right in the middle of this, um, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, I think this is a particularly important text in general, but especially right now, um, as the, the church is starting to see again 
more obvious persecution uh, from the world and uh, and from the devil that I think we should remember the church is always under persecution from the world and the devil. It's just not always obvious. Um, the, the, the world hates Christ and hates the church. That's what Jesus says, um, that do not be surprised when the world hates you or that the world hates you. Uh, St. Peter reminds us, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though something strange were happening. This is just the the, the nature of uh, the world and the devil being opposed to the Lord and his bride, the church. So when that shows up, though, in more overt forms, it's helpful to remember that because we're baptized, because we belong to Jesus, our life, um, our being is hid with Christ in God. Um, and I think the picture we want to have is, is as though Jesus, uh, Father, whoever you want to kind of picture with this, God has grabbed us and is holding us uh, uh, up to his chest and, and keeping us safe. And this is the imagery that, that Jesus will use, that, um, uh, that God holds us in his hand and no one is able to tear us away from that. And this is what it means to be hid with Christ in God. Then, even though we don't necessarily see that, we don't. It doesn't look like uh, we're being preserved in that way. We are, and we're given to see that by faith and to be encouraged and strengthened in our living uh, according to that reality. And this is going to be then at the resurrection. We'll actually see the reality. This is the when Christ, who is your life, appears. Then you also will appear with Him in glory. You have glory now. Uh, it, it's it's an eternal glory. It just is not revealed. Um, this this language of appear is similar to what Saint John does in um, in First John, where he talks about uh, Christ will um, will appear. Uh, is usually I think I was translated there, but it's actually the word for unveil. Um, and it's it's an important reality that that Jesus is still here. G Jesus hasn't like run off to go play. Um, 18 holes, and then he's going to be coming back later or something like that, right? Jesus is here. Um, he's here with us in a very profound and mysterious way. He's here with us in our baptism. He's here with us in the word. He's here with us in the forgiveness of our sins. He's here, especially at the altar with his body and his blood. Um, and this is his promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus isn't gone. We just don't see him in the same way that we will on the last day, in the same way that we could have when he was walking around on the earth. And the Emmaus disciples, since we're in Easter, the Emmaus disciples are a great example of this, right? They're walking along. They don't recognize who he is at first. And then he opens to them to understand the scriptures and he breaks bread. That's the Lord's Supper language in Luke. And then he disappears from their sight because now they're given to see Jesus in the scriptures and in the sacrament, especially. Um, and that's the same for us. But we know that he's coming back and he will appear and our glory will appear along with him. And that's kind of this whole beginning section. So that's the foundation for everything that comes in the rest of the chapter. As you said, he, he's going to draw out, I think, implications for Christians as a whole. He'll come to a table of duties that we won't get to today. Thinking about those implications for the Christian as the whole, he lists both the negative things, the things that you should put off or you should put to death, and then those positive things, those things you should put on. And that language of clothing is another baptismal language indicator. And I really want to focus especially on what Paul says to put on, starting in verse 12. So, so talk about those things that Christians put on in their baptism. I'm actually going to back us up to verse 10, oh, because wow, you've got wow. another put, put, put on there. Um, it's putting on the new self, which go. is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. So we are putting on, this is, this is, exactly the language we use in the catechism on baptism, right? That the, what is such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old man should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all evil desires. That's this, that's the, um, the once you, in which you once walked sort of stuff. Um, and that a new man should daily emerge to walk in righteousness and purity before him forever. So we are putting on a new self, a new man, in baptism, we're given to walk in that. And what that looks like then is verse 12, that we put on or clo be clothed, which is the, the language of baptism, like in uh, Corinthians, for example, explicitly, um, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So, so God describes us in three ways here. Um, 
I think it's important to not overlook um, that we have previously been described as uh, transgressors, as those who are dead, this sort of stuff. And now we're being described as those who are his chosen ones, that he has called us um, by the gospel, that we are holy, that is, we are set apart and, and sanctified through his word, and that we're beloved, right? That, that we uh, belong and are loved by him. And so what do we put on then, and how do we live according to that reality? Uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, putting on love, um, letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, um, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, uh, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness, that, that language comes up again here. Um, and then whatever you do, this is kind of the, the, the all encompassing statement, whatever you do in word or in deed, whether you're saying it or you're doing it, do everything, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, the father through him. So, so you are doing all things as one who belongs to Jesus. And what, what are those things? Being kind to one another, acting in humility before one another, not considering, considering the needs of others above your own, uh, patience, which we should remember is, um, uh, long suffering. That's the old way of translating that. And I think that's helpful because it, being patient means that you're going to have to suffer with something that you don't want to, uh, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, acting in love toward one another, um, all these sorts of things. So the way we interact with one another, um, is, uh, in Christ is particularly important. And if you look at all these, these are the things that God is doing towards us first. And then we are then basically relaying that to others. And it, it's this whole pattern of like, we love because he first loved us sort of deal. That's right. That's right. Just like St. John lays it out in his first epistle. So because our lives are hidden with Christ, this is the way that we live in this world. Paul gives us that baptismal identity. These are the consequences of our baptism in chapter three of Colossians. We're going to pick up the last chapter on the other side of the break. One more segment to go, one more chapter to go. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're going to take that short break to hear more about opportunities to support the work of KFUO during share We'll be right back. Please stick around. Right now during share is a great time for you to call in with your gift. Call 314-821-0850 or toll-free 1-800-730-2727 and support the ministry of Worldwide KFUO. share 2023. I'm Andy Bates in studio with Mary Schmidt and Pastor Doug Gribbenaw, and we have some updates for you as well. Good morning, Mary. It helps if I turn on your microphone. Everyone can hear you better that way. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, yeah, Pastor we Doug. can't pantomime on the air, can we? We're right? on you Facebook know? Live. Yeah. Oh, look, there we go. go look. To, go to Facebook and pull up KFUO Radio on Facebook. You can see us in studio. You can see Pastor Apple, Pastor Kilgo. They're, uh, Hi. They're in their own studios today <laughs> and uh, joining us remotely. All right, Mary, we have some updates. Is that correct? We do. Uh, we actually have gotten over $60,000 this morning. And we, right. we really appreciate every- appreciate everyone who has called in, made a gift online, or has given through text. We really appreciate your support. You help make this ministry work, and you help us get the gospel out there. So we and really we still you. have some matching gift fund available, till, so we can still double those gifts coming in. So we can sh- we can shoot right past 70 real soon, right, That's everybody? True. <laughs> we do. We do have a lot of matching gift left. Please help us reach that matching gift. We really appreciate your help. I'd like to thank Marilyn and Jack Kohler of Kirkwood, Missouri, who gave a gift recently, and Thomas and Barbara Pro of Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you for your gift. And I've got Mrs. Dolores Miller from St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you for supporting KFUO Radio. And Robert and Joanne Post out of Defiance, Missouri. Thank you for your gift to KFUO. I'd like to thank Dorothy Richterkester of Arnold, Missouri. She gave a gift to us. And Loretta Roth of Perryville, Missouri. We appreciate you, Loretta. Thank you. And coming out of St. Charles, Missouri, Patricia Hoffman. Thank you for your gift to KFUO. And Dolores Miller from Arnold, Missouri. Thank you for making a gift to KFUO Radio. And I would like to thank Randy and Joan Roth of St. Mary, Missouri. They are day sponsors. 
for April 20th in celebration of their 38th wedding anniversary. Thank you, Randy and Joan, and happy 38th wedding anniversary coming up. And I'd like to thank Lauren Bates, who called in. in now, why is that name familiar? <laughs> <laughs> I see Andy Gurney. That's Andy's wife. Andy and Lauren Bates are doing a day sponsor for August 31st in honor of Roger Lutke, Lauren's dad, on his birthday. Happy birthday, <laughs> Papa Raj. And I've got a couple of day sponsors here as well. Dale and Sandy Decker out of St. Louis, Missouri. Day sponsors for February 6th, their 32nd wedding anniversary. Look. Congratulations and thanks for making KFU Radio a part of that. And another name familiar to our listeners, Sarah and Luther Golseth, day sponsors, May 22nd in honor of their 13th wedding anniversary. Wow, how does the time fly, right? <laughs> Congratulations and thank you everyone for, for making gifts to KFUO Radio and now it's time for a a little gift out back, right? Because we've reached a plateau of $60,000. That is right. We've hit the $60,000 mark, and we're going to give another item from our friends at CPH. They gave us a book called Bless Our Nest. It's a coloring book and designs for Bible journaling by Ruth Pickens. It's really cool looking, and I don't know how I'm going to let this one be given away. I, I'm going to have to get one myself. Because, you know, coloring is actually really quite relaxing, and it helps you meditate on the text as you're doing it. And sometimes it feels like you don't know what you're doing, but CPH has this great book. This is a really good book. It's, actually, it's got some pages on color theory, so understanding primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. So your coloring can be better. Amen. <laughs> It tells you how, uh, it gives you some suggestions on how to enhance your coloring. So if you're wanting to improve your style, it gives you some suggestions on that. It talks about how different colors portray different stories. Is everything dark and dreary? Or is it light and, and bright? Uh, how do those colors make the story different? Kind of how the, the vestments and the appointments in the church change throughout the church year, right? It's true. And then they give you a couple pages where they show you some examples of how they've drawn. And then they give you quite a few pictures of... Uh, pictures for you to draw and improve on your color. Oh, right. We're on Facebook Live. Here, show it over there. And then let's read the name. Who gets this wonderful little gift here? So the winner of this gift is Marilyn Kohler of Kirkwood, Missouri. Congratulations, right. Marilyn. Thanks for supporting KFUO. And I hope you love the book. I, I promise I'll send it to you. It looks really fun. Thank you to all who called in and made a gift today. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Pastor Doug, for coming in and sharing the, those updates. It is time for us to get back to Sharper Iron so we can finish up Colossians this morning. Thanks for being a part of share 2023. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It's Friday, April 28th. We're studying Colossians with Pastor Sean Kilgo, who serves at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence, Kansas. Pastor Kilgo, we have chapter four before us. And in chapter four, again, after Paul gives a table of duties there at the end of chapter three, he starts to wrap things up on what it means to live the baptized life, especially in verses two to six, before he gives final greetings in the rest of the epistle. Take us in especially verses two to six and those final instructions for the baptized. Yeah, so lest we forget about it, uh, he reminds us multiple times to pray. Uh, this is one of the uh, the chief fruits of the Christian life is that we we pray. We pray for our families. We pray for our churches. We pray for uh, those who are around us. Um, we pray, and in here, St. Paul, as he does a few times, asks for prayers, um, which is maybe instructive to us that we shouldn't be ashamed to ask people to pray for us. Um, I think sometimes, I don't know if this is a uniquely modern issue or not, but um, I seem to encounter this quite a bit where where people will have almost a sort of shame in asking people to pray for them um and i'm and i'm not sure why other than i know that we've kind of become a very kind of uh private uh society um you can think back you know i'm sure a lot of listeners remember the days where you'd sit on your on your porch and all the kids are out there like running around in the street trying to not get hit by cars and then you've got like all the old guys are sitting together chatting and you've got all the old ladies sitting together chatting and everybody's just kind of together and as a community and, and you know what's going on in people's lives and you know what you need to be praying for for each other and, and you ask because there's kind of that openness in that. And now it's much more private. Everybody's in their air-conditioned homes watching 
uh, streaming and binging whatever show, right? They're all so, streaming KFUO right now, Pastor Kogo. They're all streaming KFUO. They're they're all in their air conditioned homes streaming KFUO. So, <laughs> um, so we are reminded that like we can ask for prayers, and that's a good thing, yeah. and that we should pray for those who ask for it, and we should pray for those who don't ask for it as well. Um, uh, because this follows the table of duties, that gives us immediately what we pray for. We pray for the people around us according to our vocations um, within the within the home, within the church, within society. And then we pray uh, more broadly for any other things that might uh, come to us. Um, and he gives us two or uh, uh, three kind of um, uh, adjectives on this, uh, that we are steadfast in our prayer that that is that we're, we're kind of uh, diligent in doing it uh, regularly. I know that this is always a struggle. You get this exhortation um, elsewhere from St. Paul that we are to pray without ceasing. Um, I think that there's practical ways to do this. One of the things that I tell like my confirmants and whatnot, um, there are these um, kind of persistent prayers is what I call them of, of the Christian life. Uh, Lord have mercy. Anytime we say anything that acts against God's will, um, anything that's evil in the world, anything that's bad. Um, God be praised anytime we see anything that is according to God's will, anything that's good, um, that, like coffee, for example. You know, you'd get a cup Thanks of coffee and you God. say, God be praised. Um, and then uh, uh, come Lord Jesus quickly, right, is, is kind of the, the other ones just kind of always there. We're always praying for Christ's return. And then th that covers basically everything that's going on in your life. And it's a way to pray regularly, steadfastly, um, and then we're also to be watchful in our prayer that kind of parallels a bit with being steadfast, um, but that we're to give our prayers with thanksgiving. So this shows up again. It, there's been this thankfulness, thanksgiving that's just been throughout the epistle. Paul does this quite a bit, um, and he especially likes to attach this to prayer um, that we, we so he'll talk about how he prays with thanksgiving for uh, those who are given to him, for those entrusted to his care. He he gives thanks for uh, different congregations and different people, um, and he gives thanks for Christ, right, in, in his work. So we are to pray uh, with thanksgiving, um, always giving thanks to God for what he has given to us, what he continues to give, what he promises to give. Um, and these are the three things, steadfast, watchful, thanksgiving, prayer. Uh, so that's kind of the first mark that he lays out as kind of the culmination of the, the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And then particularly what he's asking for prayer for is this, uh, that, that God would open a door uh, for the word, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind right. of what we're doing right now. That's right. Yeah. So pray, pray for your pastors, pray for those who proclaim the word, even those who are in prison, which Paul is, as he writes this epistle, he also speaks about walking in wisdom, the way that we should speak. Takes in those last two verses of that section five and six. Yeah. So, um, so when we, when we speak, I, I think these are just kind of building on an argument so that, um, there, we pray that there would be a door open for the word. Um, that is that we would declare the mystery of Christ. So there's a very specific word that we are given to proclaim. And I think that the mystery of Christ is just a summary of everything that Paul's been talking about in Colossians, right? Uh, going all the way back to the fullness of God dwelling in him, the fullness of of the deity dwelling bodily, um, his uh, baptizing us, his redeeming us from, from death and bringing us to new life, um, the new life that's lived in Christ, our life being hid in Christ. All of this is, is a mysterious thing when you start thinking about it uh, a bit. And so that's what we are proclaiming. Uh, there's a consequence to that. He's in prison. Um, that might happen to us too. Um, uh, God willing, it won't. Um, but then... We make it clear so that the, the speaking that we have is with clarity, um, and that's especially um, a description of the Holy Scriptures themselves, that we speak what God gives us to speak, and because the Holy Spirit works through that word, he speaks clearly. Um, we may not like that word, we may not want to believe that word, but it doesn't mean that the word isn't clear when it's spoken to us, um, and that we are then in that sort of speaking, that clear speaking, declaring the mystery of Christ, uh, to walk in wisdom uh, toward outsiders. Uh, so, um, and then this making the best use of the time. So I think there's maybe two things with that. One, being clear in your speech uh, is 
uh, a lot shorter than like kind of beating around the bush with stuff. You can just kind of get to the point on, on things. Um, and I know I'm not always the greatest about this. Uh, I, I tend to be limited, but um, I try. So this is part of the wisdom. But then the other one is, I think that there's a recognition that there are times in which uh, people just aren't going to believe what you're saying. And they're just, they're not there in good faith. They're not there to try and actually learn or hear these things. So you can make the proclamation um, of the mystery of Christ and then go to your other duties. Um, you've got a, you've got a home to take care of. You've got a society to live in. You've got a church to be a part of. You don't need to spend every waking moment trying to convert this one person. Uh, it's especially like if it's on social media, that, that's not a great use of our time. Um, so that, just a, um, caution caution for for those that are out there that like to try and fight all the social media battles um there, there's a time and place for it but we should use wisdom in how we do that and then finally that our speech is gracious seasoned with salt and able to answer each person so that we we don't uh we we do our best to not be jerks when we talk to people um that it's seasoned with salt that is that it's god's word that we're proclaiming and that through that word we're going to answer what people are saying to the best of our ability. And if you don't know, um, ask your pastor. Your pastor probably knows or at least where to find out. So um, there, there's a great resource that you've probably got on speed dial That's right. or should. That's right. That's right. So Paul gives us what the baptized life looks like. He gives final greetings at the end of Colossians. There's always gems there. Just briefly, I will point out that Paul within Colossians 4 mentions both Mark and Luke. Two of the four evangelists were known to Paul, and he mentions them here to the church in Colossa. This colossal epistle that he writes to teach us that Christ, in him the fullness of God dwells bodily, and in him we have everything that we need. Pastor Sean Kilgo has been our guest today. He serves at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Lawrence. Can Pastor Kilgo, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks. We did it. We made it. We made it. I hope I didn't set a bad precedent for you in the parish. Now they're going to yep. want you to go through one book every Bible study. No, Thank you, Pastor happening. Gogo. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you for listening this morning. Thank you for your support of KFUO, helping us to share Christ for you anytime, anywhere. It's been a joy to be with you today. I will talk to you again next week. <laughs>